Welcome everyone. My name is Lysan Keen, the owner of Lysan Keen, a, a gallery based in Boston. I have with me Stephen Hamilton. We are currently showing solo exhibition of your work uh, titled Passages. And this is your first solo show in a commercial gallery. Stephen graduated with a BFA from Mass Arts, majoring in illustration. So currently you are a PhD candidate at Harvard in African American studies. Uh, African studies, yeah. African and African American stuff. Okay. And you're a recent awardee of Art Adia? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what is the title of the award? Because it's, uh, they told me that it's a, uh, some special award <laughs> that you won. I, 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 don't know, I don't know what the, the very special title is, and I hope I don't get in trouble for not knowing <laughs> the special title, but I was one of the um, uh, Boston recipients or Boston area recipients um, this year. Yeah, that's uh, congratulations. <laughs> that's a big deal. Thank okay. you. Yeah, and uh, you, you are an uh, artist, educator, and uh, you are currently teaching at BC. Thank you so much, Lysan, and thank you all so much for coming. Um, like Lysan said, the show um, is called Passages, and the idea uh, for the show came from a lot of uh, different elements of my practice. So I am a weaver, I'm a dyer, um, I am a woodcarver, though that's not as much a part of my praxis as I would love to, um, love it to be. Um, and as Lysan said, my degree is in illustration and I still consider myself an illustrator because um, illustration is about telling stories. Um, so what uh, I was thinking about in the show is like thinking about how I am incorporating all of these different um, art forms in my practice, um, but also thinking about the very special roles that cloth plays um, in rites of passage. So one of the things that's very interesting is thinking about cloth as a metaphor, cloth as an ontological metaphor, cloth as an embodiment of all of these very complex, abstract ideas. Um, and then looking at context in the African continent, in the African diaspora, where cloth um, manifests as this uh, space of, trend, uh, facilitates these um, rites of passage and uh, passage between um, worlds and also thinking about these states of transition. So all the work here um, is sort of interpreted uh, through those different um, lenses. So thinking about the ways in which we pass through the life cycle, um, thinking about um, issues of birth, life, uh, death, the afterlife, reincarnation back into the physical world, and really looking at that through um, African uh, cosmologies, um, specifically Yoruba, uh, Congo um, and Igbo cosmologies. Um, I also want to say thank you so much to uh, Kira Malika Daniels who uh, wrote the um, exhibition essay um, for uh, the show um, and what was so beautiful about that essay is that she very much named one of the common grounding um, cosmologies of the show which is the Dikenga, um, the Congo cosmogram, uh, the four moments of the sun, which um, show the passage of the sun as it passes through the physical and metaphysical worlds, but also the soul as it um, passes uh, through um, the physical world uh, from, from birth uh, into adulthood, um, into elderhood and death, and then the afterlife, um, the, uh, the space of like growth and knowing um, in the um, afterlife and the other world um, to be born back into the physical world. Um, and even though this is something strongly associated with the Congo, this division of the universe, this division of the cosmos into a physical and a metaphysical world separated by water is very common for a lot of different African groups. Um, the symbols of the cross um, as an embodiment of that idea of uh, reincarnation and rebirth is um, something that's firmly um, rooted in a lot of different Niger-Congo uh, cultures um, and thinking about that as an African American, as somebody who's descended from all of these different West and West Central African cu cultures, uh, you know, Congo, Igbo, all of these different groups, um, it was something that was uh, really interesting to me because this symbol also appears in the material culture of African Americans. It appears in um, our, um, you know, in our, uh, uh, in our um, ritual epistemological systems. Um, and each of the pieces is sort of moving back and forth between Africa and the Americas, um, sort of thinking about those ideas. Um, so that's sort of like the, the, the 
theme of the show. Um, I don't want to talk at people too much. Um, and I know that uh, for, mo for many of you, you've had the opportunity to read Kira's amazing essay. Um, I think it would be better for me just to ask you, like, you know, ask you to ask questions. <laughs> so um, to ask what questions do you have about the work? How does the work speak to you? And sort of like go from that space rather than me just reciting <laughs> the definitions or the meanings that are behind each of the works. Yeah. <laughs> I was really drawn to some of your uh, drawings that seemed to be preparatory sketches for some of the figures, and then how you put together different types. Some seem to be tie-dyed, some seem to be woven, and then you paint on it. Your process is very unique, and I wonder if you can enlighten us about that. So I'm very all over the place in my practice. So one of the things that I do um, is like sometimes I'll be drawing, sometimes I'll be reading, writing, sometimes I'll be dyeing, weaving. I use a lot of very time intensive processes. So um, for example, for this piece, um, it's made up of uh, both um, hand woven um, and tie-dyed material. So, for example, um, if I'm dyeing something with indigo, that's the sort of labor-intensive process. I use pre-reduced um, indigo, but it's still, um, even with like that, you know, the fact that it's I'm not reducing it from the plant, it's already been reduced, um, that's still an all-day affair in order for me to get the colors that I want. So um, usually what I'll do is I'll dye a lot of um, cloth and I'll dye a lot of yarn. So I'll have like uh, my cloth tied up, I'll have um, my yarn put into skeins, and I'll dye all of that. Um, the same thing when I'm experimenting with different uh, natural dyes. A lot of the natural dyes that I use are indigenous to the African continent. So I'll do a lot of research on sort of the properties of this dye, um, and then I'll, exp I'll use uh, my studio as a way in which I can ex sort of experiment with that. So when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm not doing that in small batches. I'm usually dyeing a lot of material. Um, so I'll be producing this as I'm doing research. I'll be producing this as I'm drawing. And then when I have the idea for the works, I'm sort of putting all of those different things together. Um, there are instances where I'll have the idea for the work and then I'll have to make uh, the cloth specifically for the work. But then there's also um, me producing all of this work and then uh, using all of the uh, different elements that I'm working on at different periods to like put them together. Uh, the drawings that you see are studies, so usually that is happening either as I'm working on a piece or before I'm working on a piece. Some of them, um, I was struggling with uh, the painting, so I was like, okay, charcoal is a nice intermediate drawing uh, medium to use um, between doing like pencil sketches. So you can, you can sort of like really figure out lights and darks and sort of figure out how you're going to approach something in painting with those studies, so sometimes I will do them as I'm working on the pieces. Um, and then uh, when I have uh, like the drawings for the piece done, um, I will assemble all of the uh, all of the different uh, textiles that I'm using, um, and then I'll begin the painting. Um, but uh, there's also a selective process. So, for example, for this one, this is called "Dance of the Titled Mothers," um, and the theme of this work is it's paying homage to a certain titled uh, Elder Associations uh, for Elder Women in Southern Nigeria. So you see uh, prominent symbols here of, um, of those different uh, titled initiation systems. So there's uh, Igbo uh, women, Yoruba women, women from um, uh, ethnic groups directly to the north of Benin City, northern Edo women, and they're all wearing sort of the trappings of authority and wealth um, that are often associated with these female um, uh, title holders, these female chiefs. Uh, so when thinking about the textiles that I was using, 
I wanted to use textiles that were mirroring um, some of the uh, titled cloth that's worn by these women. So the piece at the top, although it's not nearly as complex and finely woven as the Opela um, Edo women's uh, titled cloth, you know, it's mirroring that cloth that's associated with um, the mothers of spirits for the, the northern, for that specific um, uh, group of people, the Opela Edo. Um, the larger cloth um, that's below it that has all of these patterns which are showing, um, that are based off of uh, patterns from Aquete Nasholona, um, is associated with a luxury textile uh, worn by um, uh, the Igbo women, um, specifically in Doki Igbo women um, from uh, the Delta area. They also export this textile to other groups of people where there's often sumptuary laws attached to like royalty and prestige. The patterns themselves are adopted from a Yoruba group called the Ijebu, um, which they use for uh, 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 Ogboni title holders. So Ogboni is a uh, men and women's initi initiation society for um, Yoruba elders um, in service to Ile, who is the goddess of the earth. So they're a very powerful institution because they're associated with the power, power over life and death. Um, and oftentimes they, they not only serve like religious functions, but also um, very important political functions in terms of their relationship with uh, royal authority. They're very prominent in Ijebuade. Um, and the um, patterns that you see are images of water spirits, because again, the, the association with earth and water um, and uh, the service of the goddess Ile. Um, so, you know, all of those symbols are sort of tying into like these ideas of. Um, uh, feminine power, because even though Oboni is uh, a men and women's initiation society, there's a very strongly feminine element to it because it's in service of an earth goddess. Um, and uh, the symbolism of it um, is symbolism tied to earth and water. Um, so, you know, thinking about creating this, this image of these powerful women, I wanted to use textiles that were glossing those traditional textiles, but also glossing that uh, symbolism was associated with uh, female authority, specifically water. So in uh, a lot of African cultures, water is um, sacred not only because of its its power to give life, but also its association with the ancestral world. Water is ambivalent. So water um, has the power to bring life and to take it away. And oftentimes this ambivalence is associated with femininity, which is why so many water deities are feminine coded, even when they're, when they're male, male deities. So these women are dancing with all of their trappings of wealth and title in this sort of watery um, uh, ancestral realm. Um, and the, the feeling that you're supposed to get is this feeling of like beauty and wealth and power, but the, the power is not, um, there's still an ambivalence that's there. So there's a, the, the, these are titled mothers and they have the power to bring life into the world but there's also a feeling that they can take life away. So uh, one of my professors, Professor Lupona, made this statement when talking about elder women, specifically in Yoruba society, they're publicly loved but privately feared because again, possessing that power over life and death. So all of the ways in which the textiles, um, like even the fact that, they're, that they're, it's dyed with indigo, which is a female craft, which is often associated with the Awunyawa, the divine mothers, the, the tersely known as like witches um, because of its association with like these navigating these like powerful like alchemical forces and also the wealth that comes from being an indigo dyer. So the ways in which like the textile itself and the material and the subject matter all relate to each other, that's all like sort of tied into the process at different points in time. If that answers your question. Mm -hmm. So that's also referencing like coolness. So like if you look at a lot of uh, African sculptures, I'm using a lot of generalizations, but I'll, I'll be specific. So if you look at a lot of sculptures, specifically Yoruba sculpture, there's this idea of this like downward gaze that you see for a lot of um, the figures. Um, and it's something that's uh, meditative and often described as self-effacing, but it's also um, showing an embodied coolness. Um, and I wanted them to have that feeling of like this like embodied like coolness. Um, because it's like these, there, there's like, 
there's a sense of coolness and also self-assuredness um, because uh, these women are in this divine space, you know, and they're embodying divine forces. Um, so that, that way in which they are posed, in which they're looking, is also mirroring the aesthetic as it appears in the um, artistic traditions that I'm glossing. So this is a, this is a, um, a theme that you see in Yoruba sculpture. This is a theme that you see in Edo sculpture. You know, thinking about the ways in that that's contributing to the painting is also something that's really important to me. So I'm from Boston. Um, my family, most of my family is from, uh, my mom was born in UC, but most of my family is from uh, Southern West Virginia. Um, so I grew up uh, with a lot of those ties because I was like very much raised by older people, raised by older women who were born there. Um, and like growing up in Boston, specifically Roxbury, that's all around you uh, because so many of these themes are so tied to you know, the black arts movement, and that was uh, tied to a lot of the public art that I grew up seeing. So it was in the muralism that I was seeing. It was in, like, I tell a story where we would go to Nubian Notion, um, and, you know, Nubian Square, what's now Nubian Square, and we would pa I would look through the prints, and there were, like, Paul Goodnight prints there, and just, like, seeing that, looking at work, um, you know, by uh, Dana Chandler and, like, Gary Rickson, um, who also were very much tied to sort of like creating this imagery which was um, really looking at the relationship between Africans and the diaspora and the continent. So that was something that I was constantly seeing growing up. That was something that very much shaped a lot of my um, early artistic memory like growing up. And then when I had the opportunity to travel to Africa and study, you know, it all sort of came full circle. You know, and just thinking about like, I remember there was an experience. I, I, what I loved about being at the Nikkei Center for Art and Culture is that Chief Nikkei um, would have me go with people who worked with her. It's like, oh, just like go with them. They're going to the framers. They're really good framers. It's good for you. Just go there and just like see it. And I remember going to the framers, and Budweiser came out with this because you know they want black people to drink their beer. So they came out with this like they came out with this line. It's called "But the African Kings" uh, like line. They hired all these black illustrators to do all these beautiful illustrations. And I remember in my church, I went to 12 Baptist Church, you know, very interesting because like it's a Baptist church, but there was a lot of very pro-black, you know, stuff in the church. Like if you understand the history of 12 Baptist Church, it does make sense, but it was like very, very pro-black stuff that was in the church. So like um, I remember seeing those growing up all the time and the framers had those same posters there and just seeing that come full circle and then also you know, having this very like strong traditional, um, looking at contemporary artists in Nigeria and also traditional artists and artisans in Nigeria, but like it's something that's been a part of my like experience growing up, you know, and it's something that's constantly fed into with the subsequent experiences that I've had. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you had like the young people you were working with, mm -hmm. you know, posing mm -hmm. as portraits of goddesses and gods and warriors. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm, I feel like I'm stepping into the water. I can ride that crocodile back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside the circle here, mm -hmm. um, to keep this circle, but I'm, I'm there. And so, what made you pivot? How did mm -hmm. you do something more spatial in a world that we can't really inhabit? So, I think with the Founders Project, I was really thinking about those as portraits. So um, I was thinking about all the elements of like world building within those portraits were reinforcing the narrative of this person's story. Um, and the idea was like I wanted to highlight these, you know, very much um, deified legendary progenitors of these um, ancestral groups. So like they're embodying like um, not only a historical person, but like they are you know, the cultural identity of a group of people like encapsulated in this historical person and then encapsulated in this young person. 
So um, they're very much imagined as portraits, you know. That's, the, that's what's bringing you into those experiences. And also the priority was like for people to see these young people, but for those young people to see themselves like mirrored. So they, they're, they're windows and they're mirrors in that way. So everything about it is like if you're looking into a mirror, you know. Um, for these, like I was really interested in like thinking about how I was going to like create um, a world because like you're experiencing a transition between worlds in each of these pieces. So like this is like in the um, this is like in the ancestral realm. This is in Mpimba. This is in the ancestral realm. You see what I mean? Like the one behind you is like thinking about this uh, second moment of the sun, thinking about this transition into adulthood, um, and then just like feeling like that warmth um, and this like, you know, you being at this moment in time in this place. You know, for Callborn, really thinking about being between two worlds and bringing that knowledge of the other world into the physical world was super important. So there had to be an element of space there. Um, and I think that there, there, are, in, there are ways in which it becomes like a mirror, but the space in the world was, was more important because it's showing a transition between like spaces and sort of imagining these points in life as like spaces that you're in, that you're moving back and forth from. So I think that that was one of the, um, the differences between um, these, because these, these ones, there's elements of portraiture, but they're not like strictly like portraits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for that one, uh, that is taken from two works. So looking, so I read, I remember early in my college career reading Flash of the Spirit by Robert Ferris Thompson. Um, and he engages a lot with the scholar uh, K.K. Bunseki Fukiao. Um, and he pretty much is using his interpretation of Dikenga in his sort of extrapolation of like the four moments of the sun. But in uh, K.K. Bunseki Fukiao's uh, uh, cosmology of the Bantu Congo, he's the world which is associated with the color black, with um, the height of uh, life, like transition from, from adolescence into adulthood, which is symbolized by the point where the sun is at the top of the physical world, associated with noon and associated with the color red. Um, so I was really thinking about like, he uses the thing as like when the child like becomes a man, when you become an active member of society, thinking about these ideas of agency and power in the physical world and thinking about that physicality as associated with masculinity. Not to say that women don't also embody that because again, masculinity is like, it's an idea, it's a concept, it's an energy. It, we all go through this period in our lives, um, but thinking about the way in which that's embodied for this young man transitioning into adulthood um, and thinking about like this relationship with this other man as like an advisor, but also like a mirror of himself, you know? So when you're thinking about um, like this idea of like this redness, this uh, physicality, movement and energy, like I was associating that with um, like this uh, transition from boyhood into manhood or from adolescence into into manhood. Um, but there are still elements in which it's mirrored. So like oftentimes in Congo context, and uh, 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 Kira talks about this in the essay, um, that red tukula is associated with women's initiation rituals. Um, and you see that in um, Nigeria, in Cameroon, the painting of the body with cam wood, um, with initi initiations from girlhood um, uh, to, to um, adult womanhood. Um, in general, Tukula, or that red, um, uh, the heartwood from redwood trees, like um, it could be camwood, it could be African barwood, it's associated with initi initiations. A lot of uh, Yoruba initiations also incorporate camwood. So also thinking about that transition, but also thinking about redness as a color of threat, as a color of precarity. It's often associated with like danger or death or, um, you know, violence, um, but, it's a color of transition. So it's a color which is associated with like um, 
moving from one space to the other, which is always marked by precarity, which is always marked by the possibility of things going good or things going bad. So um, thinking about that warmth, that heat, you know, that ambivalence between things that are creative and could be destructive, um, you know, was something that was very important. Um, you see like the blue and the cooler colors and the darker colors here, but there's also a sense of that ominousness that's slower, um, that's like uh, uh, more, um, you know, more illicit, um, that's almost like it's fermenting. So there's two different things that are happening, but they're both embodying power in a very specific way. So that one's one of my favorites, it's called Call Born. And the reason why it's one of my favorites is like, I just, I love when, you know, I can think about experiences. I can think about experiences that um, other folks from my, my cultural background can know. So like, I talk to people who are other African American folks, they'll know what it means to be born with a veil or born with a call. And like, my, my aunt told me, it was like, it means that you can see Haints. So she talked about my great great grandfather, her grandfather, they'd be walking places because he was born with the placental call. And they would be walking. He'd say, Oh, move out the way and let that man walk past. It's like, what man? Like, let that man walk past. Because he could see, because he could see, like, because he could see Haynes. And, you know, um, doing research on like what that means in different contexts, usually the call has importance no matter where you are in the world. That has a lot of significance in a lot of different cultures. But in a lot of Afro-diasporic cultures and in the African continent, it can have associations with the um, with uh, the world of the ancestors because you have that residue of that world bo born over your face. It's white or translucent or clear, which is also the color of spirits, the color of the um, the uh, the color of um, the ancestral realm. Um, and also in Yoruba land, when you're born with that call. It often means that you um, uh, should become a, a masquerader, that you should initiate into a masquerade society, um, as like uh, cited by uh, Margaret Thompson Drew in her work, um, you know, a Yoruba ritual. So there's something um, that's very spiritual about that, about like you being born with the residue of the other world. So thinking about how I was referencing um, Egungun, re referencing the masquerade with um, the cloth. Um, thinking about like the, being in this space between worlds, between this ancestral world and this physical world, um, and then uh, thinking about uh, like the the specificity of that, because like if you're thinking about a ritual specialist, you know their power comes from their ability to navigate or draw power between those worlds, um, and thinking about like other significances there. So for a lot of Afro-American, like hoodoo conjure root work traditions, if you're born with that call, it also means that you should be a conjurer root worker. So there's a special significance which is associated with that. And I, th I think that there's an interesting bridge between, you know, African-American um, traditions and uh, traditions on the continent where you see like this common ritual epistemology that's at play. Um, and that's why that's something that was so interesting and important to me. And when I was thinking about that show is like, I really want to do that because it also allows me to think about that cloth as an ontological metaphor, like thinking about that as interpreted as cloth, that that is the cloth that you enter the world in um, and marking transition um, and thinking about what does it look like for me to, um, to weave a cloth that then embodies that. It's a white cloth. It also has like uh, jute elements in it, which are also, there are specific types of bass fiber that are used to make uh, uh, sacred textiles in parts of Nigeria. Um, you know, it also has like the leno weave, the open work, which also like allows you to sort of peer behind it a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's like sort of like the ideas and the themes behind that piece. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, you know, the figure is, you think of water. Mm-hmm. So coming out of water. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's sort of like the idea, like thinking about that space of liminality and precarity. What's really beautiful about the way that uh, uh, Foucault describes um, the first, well, the, he describes it as actually the second moment of the sun. The first moment is actually in the afterlife. Um, and he, he describes Kala as being the second moment of the sun because it represents a death in the afterlife. Because you go through this process of becoming, um, of knowing, of gaining like esoteric knowledge, becoming, as he says, a winged being. Um, and then as you enter the physical world, you undergo a death to be born into the physical world. So that space between life and death is always marked by both a birth and a death. So death is a birth in the afterlife. Birth is a death of that afterlife. Yeah. Yes, yes. All the students of all students of African art will notice the like especially West West Central African art will notice like the lungfish. Um they're very important symbols. You'll see them all like you see them in the art of um Benin Kingdom, you see them in the art of Owo, Ife. Um there are even examples from Cameroon. Um you see them in uh Igbo art. Like these lungfish are super important. And what's fascinating about them is that they can breathe gulp air. So the ability to live in the water and to, to, to exist on the surface too. So like there's this relationship with like this transition between worlds and they're often associated with deities who do that. So you'll often see um, images of Olokun, who's the deity of the, and all my Yoruba speakers, please forgive my terrible accent. But like the, he's the deity or she because Olokun is imagined as male or female, depending on the context that you're in, or where you live, is, is uh, symbolized uh, by mudfish, you know? And that also represents wealth, because it also represents like, you know, if we're putting this in a historical context, the coming of Atlantic trade, and you know, Portuguese merchants and traders being associated with lungfish and the wealth that comes from the ocean. Um, but you can even take it farther than that and thinking about other wealth that comes from the water. So you can think about, uh, you know, um, jasper and shells and river stones and like all of these other things that are associated with wealth in different culture, different African cultural contexts. The wealth um, that comes from gold, which is like panned from rivers. There's so many different ways in which wealth and water are associated with each other. Um, water in terms of like uh, agricultural um, plenty, water in terms of children, children enter the world in water, you know? So there's so many different ways in which this idea of fertility, abundance, and wealth are glossed in that way and how that's often embodied in fish. And you could, you could talk, you could write a whole dissertation about that. Like you could talk about fish um, giving birth to fish laying, having thousands of, of, of children and that being associated with fertility and wealth. You could think about the fact that fish, dried fish are, are actually trade goods, you know, important trade goods because, you know, thinking about um, having uh, non, like uh, a fairly non-perishable um, protein, which would be essential to um, uh, communities um, in sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, very ancient, like, uh, fishing communities um, being present on the African continent. There's, like, so many ways in which you can talk about fish and its relationship to all that subject matter. But, yeah, I hope that that answers. Oh, I, no. So sometimes it's harder than others. Like uh, sometimes if I have it sufficiently primed, it's not as difficult. Other times it's really difficult. Like this one here, it was like very cavernous because it's very thick and like the weft. So those patterns are a type of um, discontinuous brocade. So it's a, a weft inlay. And sometimes it can be very lifted off of the surface of the, the um, off of the surface of the cloth. So, um, 
you know, you'll have to be in a situation where you have to sort of paint under it. Um, but other times it's not as difficult. So like for this one, it's a very heavy cloth, but it's not, um, it doesn't have as many of those uh, discontinuous weft patterns. So it wasn't as difficult to do. The, the paint does absorb into it a little bit because I can't gesso it, gesso it. I also, if I use too much of the matte medium or matte gel, you end up in the situation where it can be, um, you end up in the situation where it can cloud, um, which is something that I don't really want it to do. Um, so you have to have like a little bit more of a gentle touch with it. Um, but once the first layers are down, um, it's not that difficult for me, at least. I also grew up, you know, you, like artists, you, we, we've been on the struggle bus sometimes. So I also was like picking up random, and anybody who went to school with me knew this, <laughs> like picking up random big pieces of like wood and debris and painting on it. it it's So I'm used to like having to paint on things that weren't like, nice or probably what I was supposed to be painting on, so. So one of the things that I think about a lot is like, what does it mean to, what does it mean to think like an illustrator and an educator. So an illustrator is trying to convey an idea um, and an educator is trying to engage in a conversation uh, with people to encourage like learning and to encourage critical inquiry. So like when I'm looking at the work and when I'm creating the work, I want people to look at the work, specifically people from my communities to look at the work and have a desire to engage with the work. So for them to understand and relate to certain core ideas in the work and encourage them to ask more questions, not only about the work, but also about themselves, you know, about like where they come from, about who they are. Um, you know, so it's like as many, much a part of trans, translating an idea, um, but also sparking um, a desire to learn more. Um, so that's something that ties into it. Sometimes it's physically a part of it. So like for the f series that Giovanna mentioned at the, the Founders Project, the studio assistants I had, I taught how to weave. So those studio assistants were young people that I had worked with since they were teenagers that I was teaching how to weave and they were helping me with the project. Um, I also do uh, weaving and dyeing workshops, though not as many as I, I want. Um, and I also am thinking about ways in which I can, can combine like my work as an illustrator and as an educator. Um, I have a free syllabus. It is, you know, all done by me, so there are typos in it. But I have a free syllabus um, that's available online that talks about a lot of these themes. Um, so I create work and then try to make it accessible to people too. Um, and also to sort of facilitate other people having cons um, conversations about the work too. So that is a part of my practice. And in terms of like what I want to do in the long run is like find ways in which, you know, both of those things can flow into each other in different ways. Like the, the Founders Project is also part of like an online resource that's also, that's again free um, to introduce people to who these, you know, legendary progenitor, uh, uh, progenitors of these African um, ethnic groups were um, through images and through text. So like I'm always trying to find ways in which it can sort of move back and forth between, you know, this experience you're having in a gallery or in this other public space and also facilitate conversations that happen outside of that space. We're almost running out of time, mm -hmm. so we don't want to, you know, um, go over. We love hearing what you have to say and we can't, you know, we don't want you to stop. But um, let's just... Um, Take one last question and then we will end this. How's that? Okay, and then we can just maybe, you know, privately uh, attack him <laughs> <laughs> with, with questions, your own questions. Okay, so any more? If not, uh, we will call it a day. I mean, I think what, um, 
I think throughout the entire process, um, it made me really understand the sort of deep connections that I have um, with the African continent. And I think that that's reified um, with not only my practice, but through the, the, very, the very spiritual act of like creating something. Um, and thinking about like how those connections are reified through that practice of making, but also understanding how infinitely complex those connections are. So one of the things that I realized when I was in Nigeria is I realized how African and how American I was at the same time. So it was both of those things simultaneously. I know a lot of people go, I was like, I went to Ghana for a week and I realized I'm so American. And it's like, but when you gotta live in a place for nine months, you know, when you gotta go to that well and heat up that water to take your bath, when you're walking by people who are braiding hair on their like porches and saying hi to you, when you're watching people with their auntie walks walk away, speaking a language that you don't understand, but the intonation you understand, you realize something about yourself. And it just gave me a fractal understanding of blackness, something that is infinite. Baba John Mason talks about this a lot, this idea of like a, a, a infinitely expanding family group of experiences that could expand for infinity and collapse into its own essence. And I think through working on this, I learn about how complicated, how complex that is, but also how real those connections are, how they're tied into so many different things, giving me an understanding of like, not only myself, but like how I interact with my community, you know, how people interact with each other. Um, and I think, you know, it's been a while since I've been to Nigeria, but this practice of, of what I'm doing it reifies that all, every time I make. It reifies that with all of the research that I do. Um, and I also realize more and more that my artwork is my research. It's hard to learn, because like when you're in academia, you know, they, certain things are legitimate knowledge and certain things aren't. But I realize more and more this act of making is so tied to the research. It can't be removed from the research itself. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's a great way to end this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming to this event, and thank you, Stephen. Um, we, you're profoundly intellectual and intelligent. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming.